Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and over the last few weeks we've been talking about having good soil and plants to attract beneficial insects to help keep pests in check. And keeping pest numbers down in a healthy soil is going to go a long way to help reduce disease problems in the garden. But today we're going to be talking about attracting beneficial animals to the garden and the homestead. Because there's lots of animals that can be helpful around a homestead. Out here on Mossy Bottom Small Holding, we like having foxes for instance. Although I've not seen them in a few weeks, which makes me kind of worry that they might have gone or uh, even worse have passed away. Because foxes are amazing rodent predators and that's why I really like having them on the homestead. Even though I have three dogs, having foxes nearby is really great because they take out a large number of rodents and especially rats. Now, sure, if I've got chickens, I may not think quite the same way, right, about a fox because foxes are crafty and clever canines, well, part of the canine family, um, that will work hard to get into a chicken coop, right? I know a lot of people who don't like having foxes nearby because of some of these problems that then start to happen. Of course, you could always look at having a raised coop that the fox can't climb up, um, but that, of course, might cause, you know, an ideal perch for raptors and create a whole other set of problems. Um, Raptors of the bird variety, not as in like little dinosaurs running around. Um, There's some really interesting choices that you get to make as a homesteader for sure. And you know, really when it comes to things like integrated pest management, it is all about bringing balance on the homestead. And integrated pest management systems take at least three years to begin to balance. So don't be disheartened if things are taking their time. As with anything on the homestead and in the garden, do some research, learn about the animals, the insects, the reptiles and things that are in your area. Um, Here in America, the University Extension Office is a great way to find out about the local critters. Um, Also check out your state's fish and wildlife on the website. Check out things in the library, right? Books on you know, native animals and plants and, you know, insects and reptiles and all of these things, right? There's lots of resources for you. And having some education, some knowledge about what's in your area is going to help you be a better homesteader. So in this episode, I'm going to be talking about rodents because I know a lot of you are dealing with rats, mice, gophers, voles in the garden, right? Lots of different things. Um, I've talked a few times about the critter in the wall here. It is a rat, folks, and it is a smart rat. And I feel really frustrated, I think, is probably the best term to use. I I feel like I'm being outsmarted by this this rat. Um, So I thought this would be a good episode to talk about some strategies of pest control and in particular attracting beneficial animals. Now just to let you guys know um, in the UK there are some protected species of vole and mouse. Um, Here in Maine, for example, there is also protected animals. The New England cottontail is protected. Um, So throwing some caution out there. So just make sure that you know what this pest is before going down a path of trapping or even hunting, right? Um, I'm guessing that if you're listening to this podcast, you are wanting to ditch pesticides too. And that would mean avoiding using poison to deal with your pests, even the furry ones, right? Avoiding rodenticides helps actually protect natural predators that can be harmed from eating a poisoned rodent. So natural predators are things like dogs, cats, right? Our pets, but also foxes and birds of prey. So now that I've said that, Um, It is, you know, again, a good idea to kind of check in if you're not sure on what a, a pest might be, you know, get in touch with a professional, right? A lot of Um, places have you know resources that you could reach out to Um, certainly you know if you're in the UK and you think that 
you might have a pest problem and you know it could potentially be a protected species there's places that you can reach out for help to get some confirmation on there so you know we want to avoid getting ourselves into trouble and sometimes it's best to um, not be quite as hasty in tackling a problem and finding out what it actually is to start with so let's talk about owls Okay, so owls are pretty cool and they can make a huge difference in the population of rodents. Um, I was reading somewhere that an owl can eat up to 150 rodents in a year, uh, which is pretty impressive. That's that's quite a dent. Um, But an owl can munch on, you know, gophers, rabbits, squirrels, rats, mice, even some snakes. Um, Barred owls, snowy owls, screech owls and the great horned owls all actually can be found in cities somewhere especially if they're you know there's a ready source of rats and squirrels in a lot of cities and towns and if you have mature deciduous trees in your yard or in your neighborhood then you're more likely to see them so you might want to consider putting up an owl box to help these majestic predators have a safe and comfortable nesting space generally though in an urban area Owls can be found in parks, botanical gardens, cemeteries or older neighbourhoods with big trees. Cemeteries often have large old trees in them, which is why you tend to see them there. Um, But also, you know, you can see them in other spaces as well, like snowy owls. They like to hunt in kind of big open spaces, right? They typically are found, you know, in the wild, out in the tundra. But you can also spot them in places like playing fields, the beach, even airports where they're hunting. And many, many owls make homes in old dead trees. Now, dead trees in an urban setting can pose a real problem for a homeowner, right? I get it. There's uh, some super sketch trees that came down in a windstorm here. And I've got a dying maple that's growing over my uh, hubby's wood shop that's got to come down. Um, because I'm kind of worried that the, every time we have a bad storm, I'm really concerned that uh, my hubby is no longer going to have a workshop and it's uh, now, you know, got a tree in there. So, you know, I I like having big old trees, but we got to do the sensible thing, right? And if it's a safety risk, you know, sometimes it's better to, to bring it down. And that's why I like owl nest boxes as an alternative, right? Some people put them on posts, right tall posts and um, other people put them on tr- other trees in their yard even on buildings right barn owls yeah they they live in barns so you know you can build these boxes and there's tons of info online about owl box dimensions to attract certain types of owls where to put them even how to build them right owl boxes are one of the things that i'm going to be building in the wood shop uh, with my husband this summer And I'm actually quite excited to do that. I mean, you know, I don't have a lot of woodworking skills. Uh, That's where the hubby comes in. Um, But I'm actually quite excited to help build something like that that's going to really benefit the homestead. Now, birds of prey use dead trees as perches too. Um, All the better to view the surroundings for a furry meal, right? And you can build perches for raptors, right? Hawks, kestrels, falcons. They're just some common birds of prey that you can see in towns and cities. And, you know, they all like a good perch out in... um, the the small holding um was it last week or maybe the week before um i remember like hastily sending my parents a video message because i was totally astounded to see a northern harrier i'd never seen one before and there it was right in my backyard and it was awesome to watch right because they come in super low to the ground and um it you know found a a snack and off it went it was pretty pretty cool to watch but here in maine there's lots of different birds of prey out here right i've seen eagles we've seen hawks we've seen falcons we've seen lots of things but i'd never seen a northern harrier so that was really cool to see now my parents on the other hand they have a suburban home in the uk with a backyard 
And they frequently have a sparrow hawk or some other random bird of prey arrive in their garden, which is um, always makes for an entertaining uh, phone call with them because I, I love hearing about, you know, the birds. And I used to love watching the birds in the garden when I was in the UK. When I was out in Utah, not so much. There was not a lot of birds um, until after I'd been sort of gardening in the backyard for probably three maybe four years before the birds started coming in and it was you know every spring they would seem to know like oh hey this chick's got her peas in and um when the young pea plants were growing like they would be covered with birds so i would have to use um bird netting to you know try and actually have a pea harvest and um but that was kind of all just sparrows there wasn't a lot of you know, bird diversity um, in our back garden in Utah. However, the difference out here where I am in Maine, oh my goodness, every time I go outside, I see a new bird and it's just a a beautiful um, chorus in a morning of all of these birds singing um, which, you know, if I'm on the phone to, to my parents in the UK, they can hear too, which is kind of cool. Um, although today I saw a, oh my gosh, um, it was a really big woodpecker and I can't remember um, the name of it. But that, that was on um, this old maple tree that we have. So that was really cool to see. I didn't expect it to be as big as it was. It was like the size of a chicken. It was huge. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's kind of interesting to see how when you've got the right habitat, the type of animals that are started to be attracting in. So back to my parents' garden, right? They don't necessarily have perches or nest boxes in their garden for, you know, these hawks that seem to randomly enjoy visiting their garden. But the neighbor has a tall tree and a pond. So there's a room to perch, there's a source of water, and there's obviously food sources nearby with, you know, rats and mice, which are fairly commonplace, right? In a garden or in a backyard, right? These things tend to happen. Certainly when I was, you know, a kid growing up, there was fields behind the houses opposite where my parents were. So it was all like farmer's fields or cornfields, not cornfields like what, you know, we get here in the US. It was, um, you know, wheat fields really rather than corn, but we called them cornfields in in the UK rather than, um, you know, sweet corn and things growing. That was a really lengthy way of me trying to say that because there was you know, farming fields nearby because we lived in a village, there was a source of food for rodents. And, you know, it was kind of normal for rodents to be seen, right? We had cats growing up, right? Cats, great natural predators. Uh, They would often bring a gift and that gift may have been a mouse. But that's not the only predator that you could attract to your garden and your homestead. Now, certainly here in uh, America, snakes are a good predator of rodents. And there's a huge number of snakes here in America, right? There's plenty that will prey on rodents like the gopher or garter snake. Of course, there's ones that are venomous to humans like the cottonmouth and the rattlesnake that people want to avoid. And uh, certainly if you are landscaping or trying to cut back a neglected area of a garden, um, you want to be cautious of disturbing critters like snakes, especially if you're, you know, new to an area and you don't necessarily know what's poisonous and what's not. It's really good idea to be cautious, right? Now, snakes don't just prey on rodents. They also deal with things like slugs, snails, even frogs make it on the menu too. And attracting a snake is relatively easy. Um, You know, you need to make a shelter for the snake, like an old stump, a plank of wood or plywood placed flat on some bricks or stones. Something that's going to make a nice like little hiding hole or a safe space for the snake. Um, You want to be setting up a hiding hole in something like clumping or tall 
tufting grasses, right? Maybe have a wild area of your yard and a source of ground level water like a pond or a shallow bird bath or a fountain is a really good attractant for snakes. It's also a really good attractant for rodents. So um, sometimes you get one and the same. Attracting natural predators doesn't work for all gardens and gardeners, right? Not every gardener is going to want a snake in their yard. Not every gardener is going to be able to, you know, attract in birds of prey. And not everybody wants to either. They're big and kind of scary. Um, and that's totally, totally understandable. But if you've got a bigger lot, right? I know people in you know, older neighborhoods tend to have like bigger gardens and things. That might be something that works for for you. But if you've got a tiny plot of land, that might not be what's going to work for you. So let's talk about some ways that you can, um, you know, look at reducing mammal pests. And there's a lot of good reasons to do so, right? Rats and mice, aside from carrying a petri dish of diseases right they can also cause thousands of dollars of damage in a home from things like chewed wiring in the walls wiring damage on your dishwasher or other appliances in the kitchen that's what's happened right now i've got a brand new dishwasher and a rat has chewed all of the wiring in it so that was great um but you know that's not the only thing that can happen right food loss re- replacement costs of the food rep- repairs to flooring baseboard rafters walls right they cause a lot of damage and you know i've talked many a time about the critter in the wall here and um you know i've been i don't know it seems to be like all oh, my parents ask me now every time i call them up they're like have you caught the rat yet uh, <laughs> so um, you know, you've got to have a good sense of humor about these things because I feel like I'm being outwitted by this rodent right now, um, which is kind of depressing. Um, but there are steps that we can take to help deter rodents. And first and foremost is to tidy your yard, right? You want to remove hidey holes, things like wood piles, rock piles, long grassy areas. You want to trim shrubs and bushes up from the ground to deter the rodents because those are providing a hiding spot. They're helping protect them from the predators. So that's why we want to clear those up and out of the way. So you want to get rid of things like weeds, overgrown areas, debris anything that you think that you know a critter is going to be able to you know kind of hide from things that's when we want to get rid of that we want to avoid having ground level sources of water that animals are drawn to um, which you know is kind of one of those things where you've got to make a decision because there's a lot of good benefits for having a source of water um, in a garden right it helps bring in things like frogs and toads which can help you know, reduce things like slugs and snails and stuff like that. But, you know, are you getting more, you know, pest control from slugs and snails or are you having more damage from the rodents coming in? Maybe consider using rodent proof uh, composters. You could get uh, tumbling composters made of metal that are off the ground. Um, You can also commit to regularly turning your compost pile to deter rodents from making a home in your compost bin. Um, But you really do have to be vigilant in doing that um, and using the compost because um, you know, it's, it's kind of scary (laughs) from, from, uh, Many a gardener I know who's been on the allotment who has gone in to um, turn their compost bin only to have something scurry out of it. Like, that that's not pleasant. Um, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why I really like tumbling composters is because I don't have that worry anymore of... Uh, what's going to come out of out of this compost pile um, especially if you're busy working you know Monday through Friday you know you've not always got time to get out and turn your compost every few days so um, you know maybe consider having a different type of composter Another thing that we can do to reduce and deter rodents is to avoid feeding birds and feeders in your garden. Um, If you want to feed the birds, you could try having native plantings of plants or other bird feeding plants instead. You know, some people have certain types of plants like sunflowers come to mind um, to feed um, birds. 
rather than having bird feeders. Um, you can keep changing things in the garden, like move things around, put things in the way of where rodents are active. Um, animals like rats tend to hug along wall we- uh, walls and fenceways. They like to be up close to something and you can move things around that would block where they would normally um, run through. They they don't like things that are new. So if you're regularly changing things up, like they, they don't like that and tend to move on a little bit uh, more. Um, you can also... Um, you know, if you're going to be moving things around, think about having things like um, planters or potted plants that you can move and you can fill them with like scented herbs, things like peppermint or lavender that are supposed to help deter rats and mice. So that's a good way too to, you know, have more um, plants in your garden and, you know, move things about a little bit to uh, help deter rats and mice. Uh, keep your lawn mowed. That is a really good one because long grass attracts rodents, as do shrubs up against the house. Um, so you want to be, um, you know, removing that coverage from predators, right? I said earlier that long grass and shrubs help provide that protection and coverage, right? It helps keep the rodents out of sight of your predators. Now, you know, certainly here um, on the homestead, for those of you that are part of the Facebook group, you will have maybe seen a picture that I posted of when we bought the property. Um, and then after we did some mowing and, um, I mean, kudos to my family because, um, they did a lot of cutting things back with some hedge trimmers because we didn't have our stuff yet and a push mower, um, that I think one of us brought, it might've been, I think we brought the push mower. Um, but we did like cleared an acre of that just with those tools, um, and that made a huge difference in, you know, getting rid of the weeds and helping open things up a bit. So the native birds of prey are able to, you know, see the rodents and, uh, you know, get themselves a an easy meal. Um, and um, now that we've been clearing like shrubs that are right up against the house that have been, you know, growing right against the house for a number of years, we're starting to you know, make things unattractive as being a home for um, rats and mice. And uh, hopefully this is a good step in deterring the critters in the walls and in the basement here. Um, But we also want to, you know, do other kind of hygienic practices, right? So cleaning up sources of food. So if you've been grilling outdoors, you know, clean up after that, you know, pick up things like drop food and stuff on the patio or on your decking and put it into the garbage, right? Don't leave things outside and um, keep garbage in lidded trash cans, right? Indoors too, we want to be um, cleaning up quickly after cooking and sweep and vacuum regularly. And, you know, if you've got, you know, food packets, like things that are in bags or boxes, right? things that are easy to get into we might want to consider switching those into sturdy containers right i have you know containers of things like flour or um, dried fruit nuts you know rice um, pasta all that kind of stuff it's all in plastic um, containers Um, although i would love to have ceramic containers they're incredibly expensive um, but right now the the plastic ones do a relatively good job at holding things up unless it is animal feed um, and unfortunately if you are doing the suburban homesteading thing um, you know if you've got chickens and stuff you know that you've got to have some feed and you've got to store that somewhere um, I used to have chicken feed in in the basement uh, where I lived in Utah which was which was fine and dandy. Um, I wouldn't be able to have like chicken feed in my basement here um, because it's uh, an an easy point of entry for rodents here. Um, So animal feeds, um, including my dog food, um, because that was what wall rat was getting into. Um, It is now stored in what I'm calling farmhouse rustic storage bins uh guys it's a metal trash can with a lid and it's going to hold up 
much better than the plastic storage bins that I had things in, um, which is fine. And that's, you know, what's going to be needed. But certainly when we look to get getting chickens, their feed is going to be going in the same thing too. Um, and that's, you know, just what we're going to have to deal with because now we live rurally. Um, there's things like this that are more commonplace than what they were when we lived in the suburbs. Um, other things that we can do is feed your pets, then pick up their bowls and wash them right after. Don't kind of leave food out all the time. Uh, rats especially are attracted to water bowls if you leave those overnight. Um, you know, leave them out. As they are dr dripping outdoor faucets or taps um, and other water sources. Like rats need quite a lot of water. So if you've got kind of leaks and things like leaky pipes, um, that's often, uh, you know, a way that they're attracted into a home, uh, which I didn't realize until I was chatting to um, somebody that um, dealt with pest control. So um, the things that you learn. Um, other things that we can do to reduce pests is to close up access to your home. And obviously when I'm talking about some of these things as they relate to the home, because this is kind of what's happening here on, on the, the homestead. Um, but this, some of these practices are things that you could equally do to your greenhouse or your shed um, to help make them not an appealing um, shelter for rats and mice. So you want to be closing up access so anything that's bigger than a quarter of an inch needs the gaps filling right you can install things like um metal flashing or metal kickboards to you know reduce some of the burrowing you could look at um, having hardware cloth being put down again to reduce burrowing from things going up and under um certainly here um trying to fill gaps at a quarter of an inch is quite a lengthy task it's taking some time here um i mean just in the basement i have what's known as a field stone basement so basically when um, they built the house in the 1700s they just kind of got boulders and rocks and stuff that were already here on the land and that's what they used to make the walls in the basement and as such there's gaps and things that have happened over the 200 years um and um you know since uh, my my husband's away um i have learned how to mortar i've had to put up hardware cloth metal flashing to close up holes um that you know the wall rat has made um so there's there's things that um are frustrating when you know you find that you have um a pest that has made it to the house um motion detecting lights can be a really great deterrent for rodents certainly rats and mice they don't like to be in the daylight um they prefer to be in places that are dark because they're protected from predators that way um gophers mm, gophers are interesting little characters um they can be deterred from your garden by using underground barriers so hardware cloth um is a really good choice so if you've got planter boxes and um, put hardware cloth on the bottom of your planter boxes before placing them on the ground um because your plant roots are still going to be able to go through but the gopher is not going to be able to go through that hardware cloth as easily so that's a good good option for you um if you've got a bigger garden then i've heard of people that are creating kind of these hardware cloth um underground barriers around and then some fencing on top to kind of make it look a little uh prettier but that's that's an option too and people have had some really good success with doing that um gophers generally don't like strongly scented plants um so you could plant um things around your garden perimeter like lavender rosemary sage peppermint uh, even chili peppers to help deter them from coming into your garden um, other people have had success with sprinkling hot sauce around gopher burrow holes or even coffee grounds which i thought was quite an interesting one i have tons of coffee um so i might try that one if it is a gopher that i have i don't know that it is a gopher it might be a mole and if it's a mole then they are quite happy eating invertebrates they are not going to be eating my veggies so i'm kind of okay to let them be 
Um, but trapping is something that you may need to do and I definitely don't enjoy doing it. Um, unfortunately for me, it has to be done. Um, although wall rat is avoiding all of the traps that I have and the trap, you know, the snap traps have a delightful smorgasbord of bait from vegan chili to peanut butter. So there's all sorts of different things that, you know, I'm trying to tempt it with. Um, but in the garden, um, or even in your home, then, you know, you might need to look at putting snap traps in wooden boxes or plastic boxes with an entrance hole to protect your pets from investigating the traps. Um, there's tons of step-by-steps online for making kind of these snap trap boxes and stuff. Um, but you know, as with anything, if you're not comfortable doing it, you aren't, or you aren't sure, you know, get a professional and get somebody to help you. And, um, you know, that's, always a good option to go with is to um, ask for help when you need it. So I would love to hear from you. What pests do you deal with in your garden? Let me know over in the Facebook group. Until next time, I hope your garden grows beautifully and I will see you all next week.